All right, Alexander, let's uh, do an update on uh, Ukraine and on the economic situation, but more like the collective West crisis, which is uh, a result of uh, sanctions against Russia connected to Ukraine. So this will probably be a, another two-part video. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's focus the first part on, uh, on the military situation, what's going on on the ground. In Ukraine, we had the... Uh, the Kherson counteroffensive, the Great Kherson counteroffensive, which is on its seventh seventh day seventh and day? on its third or fourth wave, depending on, on yeah. who you ask. Yeah. And uh, now we're getting reports. Well, we got reports from uh, the Alensky regime, Adostovich, who said this is not going to be a shock and awe, but a slow grind. Uh, the collective mainstream mainstream media is parroting that those uh, those sentiments. According to the Alensky regime, they're taking these little villages, uh, but then it seems the Russians are taking these villages back. <laughs> Anyways, all kinds of back and forth. If you want my opinion, I sp I'm seeing a lot of all kinds of back and forth. But I think the main area which is most interesting is the Ingulets. I yep. think that's the most interesting yep. area, if you ask me. And now we have the news that all of this that I've just talked about in Kherson is actually a distraction because the real counteroffensive is taking place in Kharkiv, and it looks like that's where things are now uh, moving towards. So I guess the great Kharkiv counteroffensive. Yeah. Fill us in as to yeah. what's going on in uh, in Ukraine. And and my one, qu I've got a question. Kind of, you know, why, how, mm -hmm. what, why, mm -hmm. and how is 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 Ukraine doing this? I guess it's kind of like a two part in a way. Why? Yeah. Because yeah, I I thought that it would be better if Ukraine took a defensive posture, but I guess not. And then the question is how? Because a lot of people are asking, uh, was, was Zelensky hiding troops? Was he hiding equipment? Was the U.S. and NATO trying to outsmart uh, Russia by saying we've delivered X javelins and high bars and switchblade drones, but we actually delivered... This many and, you know, was was the whole article about 70% uh, of, uh, of the equipment is going to the black market or being destroyed. Was that also a fake out? I mean, just all kinds of, of fog of, of war, maybe information warfare. I, I, I don't know if you can explain it because obviously we're not we're not on the ground there. We don't see things there, nor are we part of the general staff of either of the two, uh, the two sides. But uh, let's try to. Let's try to uh, decode this as best we can, what's going yeah. on. Well, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, that, That's the, all we can do, by the way. That's all we can do. Well, it's all we can do. It's try to decode it as best decode we can. It, as best yeah, we absolutely. can, exactly. I mean, one of, the, one, of the, one of the fundamental problems with understanding all of this is that Ukraine pours out information about what it's going to do. And it's never, it never often makes a great deal of sense. So my overall impression is that they're going for broke. They're attacking in every possible place they can. There was a report a couple of weeks ago that the Ukrainian chief of staff, a man called General Zeluzhny, came along to Zelensky. He said, let's not attack in Kherson. This is a bad idea. It's, we, we would have to advance across flat steppe land. There's no, uh, there's no cover there. We don't have an air force to speak of. Our air defences are simply broken. We don't have much... Uh, um, we don't have much heavy equipment, much artillery. Let's instead concentrate on attacking where it would be easier for us to attack, which is in the forested area in Kharkov region, which is heavily forested. We can infiltrate people there by foot. They can use the trees as cover, and that would be a more effective place to carry out an offensive. So Zelensky heard that, and what he decided to do was that instead of choosing one of these two options, he decided to attack in both places. And he's now launched attacks both in Kherson region, and we've seen that going on for seven days, and it doesn't seem to have achieved very much, except a lot of Ukrainian soldiers have been killed, thousands of them, and thousands more have been wounded. But now um, Aristovich comes along and he says, well, you know, this is going to be a slow grind in Kherson region, but never fear, because we're taking the attack in other places too. So we are attacking in Kharkiv region as well. 
Now, if you were to approach this in a rational way, as I suspect military commanders probably would try to do, I think you're absolutely correct in saying that the key point where the fighting ought to be happening is in this bridgehead that Ukraine obtained actually some weeks ago before the offensive started on the uh, across the Ingulets River. They managed to build some pontoon bridges across the Ingulets River. They've defended them very effectively against the Russians. They've sent troops across. They've established a, a bridgehead there. And that ought to be, logically, where you'd expect the battle to happen. And... The problem is they've not been able to break out of that bridgehead. They've been heavily bombed in that bridgehead. They've suffered very heavy losses holding that bridgehead. Apparently, supplies to that bridgehead are dwindling. But they're not pulling their troops back across the bridgehead. They're not conserving them. As I said, they're instead now trying to attack somewhere else. And I get the sense that they're now trying to achieve some sort of thing that they can pass off as a victory as soon as they can, because they sense that with the gathering crisis in Europe, with the political situation in the United States becoming increasingly difficult, with the gathering economic crisis in Ukraine itself, they are starting to run short of time. So it's a little bit like the person who's at the roulette tables. It's constantly gone against them. So now they're going for broke. And they're going for broke by throwing in whatever they have, whatever equipment they have. And it's looking increasingly as if actually it isn't that much. As far as I can see, if you look at the pictures from the Herson offensive, you have people advancing on foot with a few tanks. I mean, it doesn't look very impressive. And I suspect they're now trying to do the same in um, in, in Kharkov region as well. So they're, they're trying, they're attacking in all sorts of directions, hoping that somewhere something will break. Of course, if it doesn't, then it will be, it will be very bad for them. But, you know, they're gambling. I mean, that, that's basically what they're doing now. In contrast to what General Zaluzhny wanted to do, which is conserve your resources, keep the fight going as long as possible, hope that at some point the Russians start to tire or lose interest or break. Now, I have to say, now this is the one point I'm going to say in Zelensky's defence. I think this is militarily irrational. But... I think that Zaluzhny, maybe the professional, he may be saying, you know, let's stay on the defence. It makes more sense for us to do that. But the one thing Zaluzhny has never done, as far as I can see, is provide Ukraine with a plan to plan for victory. So given that he wants to keep Ukraine on a permanent defensive when the Russians are st steadily and remorselessly advancing, one can understand why someone like Zelensky says, well, look, I, you know, I hear what you say, Zelensky, but you're not offering me with a plan for victory. So I'm going to just go ahead and do this, go and do this anyway. I'm going to throw my troops into the Kherson region. I'm going to throw my troops at Kharkov. Many of them, many of them will no doubt die, but just possibly something will happen somewhere, some, some breakthrough will take place. I can call that as a victory. I can rally support in the West, in Ukraine itself, and that will put me in a better position than I would otherwise be. Right. Uh, we've been saying this for a while now that um, Zelensky is very much fighting a, a type of war that is that is tailor-made to, to his strengths, which is yeah. uh, an actor, a comedian, a media personality. And so him yeah. and his team, which are also all producers and script writers, uh, they're, they're, they're very much concerned about the optics and they want mm -hmm. to fight a war where they can get, um, where, where it could result in some sort of big media PR win. Yeah. So if they could take this village or raise this flag um, or, or show some territory on a map being absorbed, then for them, 
yeah. you know, they could spin it along with the help of the of the collective West massive mm. soft power that the collective mm. West has, the massive media power. They can spin it into the big big uh, PR victory, a big optics victory, which would then result in more money, more weapons, and just all kinds of kinds of stuff going their ways. You know, another another ten villas in Tuscany, right? Um, so. so it's no surprise that Zelensky is going this route and saying we need a victory because, you know, he wants the next chain of events to happen. So he wants that victory. And even if it's a small victory, he knows that he can spin it into something yeah. very, very big. He yeah. does have the, the support to do that. Zeluzhny, uh, you know, by he, I think he understands that he can't win. Yeah, this is not this is an unwinnable war. So yeah. for him. Would it be fair to say that as a military professional, yeah. would it be fair to say that for him, he's saying, you know what, let's just hold out as much as we can. And to be quite honest, I'm looking forward. I'm, I'm trying to think how he might be phrasing yeah. it. I'm looking forward to the day when the Biden White House and the EU pull their support yeah. from us. Yeah. When they ditch us, because then I can finally sit at the table with my counterpart and we can get to a peace agreement. Yeah. In other words, his path to victory is not really a, a Ukraine victory over Russia, but it's a way to to just exhaust not the Russians out, but exhaust yeah. the collective West out yeah. and say, OK, now that they're exhausted, they're tired of this war, I can finally sit down with the Russians and we can get to, to, to some sort of, uh, of peace agreement. And hopefully yeah. the Russians will not have gobbled up as much land as, as, uh, as they were anticipated. I mean, is yeah. that fair? Is that a proper it, way it, to it, kind it, of maybe look at the two, the, the two sides? It could be, it could very well. I mean, I think, on, I think on Zelensky, you've got him absolutely correct. I mean, that is exactly what he is. It's all about media optics. I mean, we had a bizarre incident which happened. Um, over the last couple day or so, when uh, uh, Ukrainian forces were sent to occupy a village, a deserted village. There were no troops there. <laughs> they raised the flag. It was all talked about as some great victory. And then they immediately v pulled v out. V yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly, v v exactly, v exactly, v exactly. V exactly. Yeah. Except, of course, as it turns out, that um, they weren't just, it wasn't completely casualty-free because the other side were on a, Hill, they saw what was going on. They lobbed some, some shells, and two Ukrainian soldiers were killed. So you know, but but that is very much the style that the whole Zelensky government has brought to this war. I mean, these very weird attacks on the nuclear power station, which I have to say, I, I they were so strange that I I I I'd had real doubts that they'd even happen. That you know, I thought maybe the Russians have invented all of this for some reason of their own. But it now seems as if they really did happen. Again, it's very much PR stuff. It's playing out a, f a film role, if you like. Zeluzny, as you correctly say, is a military professional. And I think what he's doing, what he's trying to do, is to preserve as much of his army and, of, and as much of Ukraine as he can until something turns up, either the Russians break or the West breaks one way or the other. He's then got something left which he can bargain with. And I think, you know, that that is a rational approach, but it's not one that Zelensky and his people, of course, are interested in. It must be a very odd dynamic between the two. OK, uh, final question before we shift over to the mm. economic uh financial situation, energy situation. Um, Putin, the Kremlin, Shoigu, they're having this, uh, they're, they're having these, these Vostok drills and they're all in the, in the east of Russia right now. I believe Putin was in uh, Kamchatka the other day, along with his entire uh, team. And um, it seems like, like they're, once again, they're, I'm not saying they're not concerned. Obviously mm -hmm. the, the conflict is number one on their agenda, but they're still mm. going on with business as usual, yes. you know, yes. they're still just, and they're, and they're having these massive drills with yeah. India, with China, the Vostok mm. 2020. I mean, they're, they're not missing a step. No. Is this a sign that they're very 
comfortable and confident in the way things are going? Or is this a sign, as many people on the interwebs, many analysts are saying, that perhaps Russia is underestimating the Ukrainians and they're taking their eye off the ball? I'm just telling you what various analysts yeah, yeah. Um, may be saying. And then the second part to my question, so we can finish this out, is uh, and this is probably something that would, it would be great if we had, like, say, uh, Brian at the New Atlas or Andre uh, Martianov sound off this as, as well. But... I want to throw this your way because a lot of people talk about this. Why isn't Russia just sending massive air, air, air support? Where are the Russian jets? Where yeah. are the Iskanders yeah. and the Calibers to just, you know, level, level these areas? Kherson and, and now Kharkiv. Just to, you know, all these – this great counteroffensive is coming our way. How come Russia just doesn't throw all their might to just, you yeah. know, be done with this once and yeah. for all? Yeah. And, and, and I understand the question. No, absolutely. I think it's, I a, yeah. it's a valid question that a lot yeah. of people have. You know, why, why is Russia engaging in this type of, you know, back and forth and this dueling with, with, with Ukraine? How come they just don't throw all their, their, their real military might yeah. at, uh, at Ukraine? And, and I've got a lot of reasons in my head why. And, you know, yeah. there's also the, the, uh, the fact that Russia still has not declared war. I mean, this is still to the Russians a special military operation. It's a very small force in comparison to to their overall power yeah uh, but we are seeing russia move in a lot of reinforcements so anyway yes. those t t kind of a two-part question there but uh this will finish out the the yeah. segment with regards yeah. to everything that's happening in ukraine on the ground yes right now to, to answer the first question you're absolutely right shoigu uh, gerasimov the chief of general staff and putin are all in the far east at the moment um now i think it is inconceivable that they're not all the time at every moment that they have spare looking at the situation in Ukraine. I don't believe that they're taking the eye off the ball. It is ultimately too important for them. And over and beyond the fact, of course, that they're fighting Ukraine in Ukraine, they also must be aware that the U Ukraine has behind it the might of the United States and the collective West. So clearly they must be taking this extremely seriously. And there's no objective reason why they can't make decisions in Vladivostok as well as in Moscow. I think they have to go to places like the Far East. They have to give this impression that it's business as usual, because if they didn't, if they created a appearance that this whole situation was getting out of control, that might actually create a sense of crisis and that could feed on itself. So I think at one level, they want to preserve the appearance that it's business as usual. And, and I think there's a psychological element to this. I think at the same time, though, I think they are pretty confident because they know that whatever Ukraine achieves on the battlefields in the short term, they have the military power at their disposal to reverse it. So I, I don't think they feel under pressure. And if you, if you follow them, if you look at them, if you look at their body language, I mean, Putin was in Kaliningrad, the other end of Russia, quite recently. He was talking to people. He seemed pretty relaxed. And I, you know, unless he's a superlative actor, which, well, no doubt to a certain extent he is, but not presumably up to Zelensky's standards. But I think deep down, all of them feel, you know, this is this is going OK. We don't need to panic. We mustn't certainly mustn't give the appearance of panic by rushing back to Moscow, taking all kinds of urgent decisions there, that sort of thing. We can keep an eye on this properly from Vladivostok. So let's do it. And I think that's probably what is working there as well. Now, why is Russia not acting more purposefully in Ukraine. Now, I have a feeling, this is my own feeling, that we are actually reaching the point fairly soon when the Russians are going to start escalating in Ukraine. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 it's not always easy to make a huge amount of sense of Russian troop movements. But, you know, I'm sure you've seen the film of the Russian trains rumbling with all the heavy equipment into Crimea across the Kerch Bridge and also the you know, convoys of lorries with Russian troops or troops from this third army lumbering into Donetsk as well. But I think that 
one of the reasons why this thing has gone in the way that it has is the way it was politically presented at the start, which is that this was Russia coming to the rescue of Donetsk and Lugansk, Russia recognized Donetsk and Lugansk as independent countries. It then signed a treaty of mutual defense with them. Donetsk and Lugansk asked for assistance to repel what they said was a Ukrainian attack. And the special military operation was put together for that purpose. It was put together for the purpose of defending Donetsk and Lugansk. It was not put together, at least not openly, for the broader purpose of taking over the whole of Ukraine. And that explains the, the limited nature of the operation at the beginning. Now, I'm not making that up. Putin has explained that. He's actually discussed this in many places. He's also said that the reason the Russian army moved into other places in Ukraine was so as to impede the Ukrainians from concentrating entirely all their resources on Donbass. So that's what Putin said. I think that what the Russians found was that taking this softly, softly approach to the war worked politically to their advantage. It worked politically to their advantage in Russia because it meant that people felt that Russia was acting defensively protecting the Donbass, not seeking to conquer territory. At least that was the initial sentiment. And I think that it worked very effectively in terms of the international position, Russia's international position. It meant that countries like China, like India, like many of the African states, many of the ASEAN states, the Latin American countries, the Middle Eastern countries, which would have been concerned if this had been a straightforward war to conquer territory in Ukraine, were have been supportive of Russia precisely because they've seen this as a defensive war. Now, I think the calculus is changing. I think people in across the world have been getting much more understanding and educated about what's been going on in Ukraine. I think the mood in Russia itself has changed. And as I said, I think we're going to start to see from this point forward, especially with Ukraine trying to launch offensives in all sorts of directions, we're probably going to start to see a Russian counter escalation beginning to take shape. Now, that brings me to the last point is why hasn't Russia bombed cities, destroyed infrastructure, obliterated bridges? Well, again, if you go back to the terms of the initial remit of the special military operation. They actually said that they would not occupy cit cities or destroy civilian infrastructure. And they still clearly bound by those rules if they modify them and change them, which I'm sure now they will, then I think you will start to see a much more aggressive operation of the Russian Air Force and missile forces and those sort of things over the next few days and weeks. But again, and this has been pointed out to me, by the way, lots of emails I've been getting from Russians. I mean, because, you know, Russians follow our programs as well. And these are not political people. These are ordinary Russians. And several of them have said, you know, we've got to understand that for us, Ukraine is not just a foreign country. We have families there. We're interconnected with these people. Ukrainian soldiers, many of them are our relatives. An all-out war against them is something that it is difficult for us to do, to contemplate. I think we're evolving to that point where it may happen, which probably will happen. But I think it's taken a long time both to bring Russian opinion and international opinion to that point where the Russians can feel they can do it. All right. So that's a good place to pause for the first part. And now let's move on to the economic.